Hey folks, Andy Patton here. The Zags are on the road against the Dons of San Francisco Thursday night. I'm going to list my five things to watch for this game before answering a few listener listener questions and grading some listener submitted hot takes for Andy Locks. All right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to take you through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. I want to thank all of you who make this podcast your first listen of the day and remind you to check out the show on YouTube. If you have not already, very simple, go to youtube.com, search Locked On Zags, you'll find the Locked On Zags channel. It's got all of the shows organized by guests, by Mailbag Monday shows, by Hot Take shows, all of it laid out for you perfectly just like that. You can hit that subscribe button at the top of the screen. Join the community on YouTube. All right, the Zags have a big, big game tonight, part of two very big games to finish out the week. Contrary to many people's popular belief, Gonzaga actually has arguably the toughest final week of the regular season amongst many of the top 25 teams. They're playing San Francisco and St. Mary's on the road. Two top 25 teams per Ken Palm's ratings. I believe there is only one other team in the top 25 who is playing two, tw- two top 25 teams on the road in their final week of the regular season. So don't let them out there fool you into thinking that Gonzaga's schedule is always a cakewalk this particular week. It is perhaps the most challenging conference schedule of any ranked team the final week of the season. I think the Zags are going to take care of business. They've, they've beat both these teams already. Obviously, they have not lost in WCC play, but on the road against Todd Golden's San Francisco squad and, of course, Randy Bennett's St. Mary's squad. Not going to be easy. We're going to focus on the Dons today. Five things I'm going to be watching for in tonight's contest. Number one, a question that spills over from the last time these two teams played. I'm curious if the Zags are going to continue to face guard Jamari Bouye. Face guarding is a technique where one player on the defensive team, in this case it was Rasir Bolton last time, only focuses on guarding their player. They do not play help defense. They do not sag off their guy to be in a better defensive position to grab a rebound or, again, help on somebody else defensively. They just sit right in front of the guy that they're guarding and focus on nothing else. It effectively means that the other two or the other players are playing four-on-four basketball and Rasir Bolton and Jamari Bouye are just taken out of the offense uh, in that situation. It's sometimes a very efficient strategy. The Zags have used this before, not just on Bowie earlier this year. I distinctly remember them using it against, uh, I believe it was North Dakota State uh, in the 2014 NCAA tournament with Gary Bell, one of their best players. They've done it other times in conference play. They've other, done it other times in the NCAA tournament. Uh, Bouye, obviously a dynamic score, a guy averaging 17 points per game, who scored over 20 many times this season. San Francisco has more balance than just Bouye, so it's not necessarily something that you would think a team would do against a, a team like this because, you know, it's not like it's when it was Anthony Island at LMU and he'd score 30 points and the rest of the team would score 15. <laughs> yeah, San Francisco's got a little bit more balance than that, but Bouye is what makes the engine go. And I could see an instance where they have Bolton or somebody else potentially spending the majority of their game just face guarding Bouye. It's also a glimpse into how the Sags might potentially handle some of the top tier guards they're going to face in March. Obviously, Bouye is one of the better guards in the NCAA, but they're going to see a lot more very good guards in March. And we, we if we see them do this again here and it works successfully, it could be a key into some way that they're going to continue to play the defense in March. It also leads into my second bullet point. What are Hunter Salas's minutes going to look like? Hunter Salas could be a very valuable player off the bench defensively against San Francisco. He could be used to guard Jamari Bouye, which allows Bolton or Nemhard or other guards to focus more on Khalil Shabazz or Gabe Stefanini or Rich Wayne or anybody else on San Francisco who can definitely light it up and cause Gonzaga some problems. Salas played eight minutes against Santa Clara a game when they needed defense against P.J. Pipes, they needed defense against Jalen Williams, 
few opted to rely on his starting guards, Andrew Nembhard and Rasheer Bolton, who are currently contributing more offensively to this team than Hunter Salas. And they felt few must have felt that their offensive contributions, their experience was more valuable on the floor than having Salas and his defensive intensity, his athleticism on the court at the same time. Salas also played nine minutes against San Francisco the last time these two teams played. So it's not looking like it's going to be a high minutes game for Salas. Once again, there's been a lot of clamoring for Salas to get more minutes, to get more involved in the offense right now. He's kind of an afterthought offensively. He does a lot of cutting to the basket, gets a lot of cheap lay-ins that way or alley-oops, but he's not a playmaker. He's not a facilitator. He's not only being asked to run the offense. I can understand why they don't want to all of a sudden throw that role on him this late into the season. I don't expect that to happen, but it does seem like he's not getting playing time because of that, when in reality he could be very valuable defensively against a Jamari Bouye or even put him again, put him on Gabe Stefanini or Khalil Shabazz and help shut those guys down as well. I'd love to see that this game. I'd love to see 15 minutes of aggressive, intense defense from Hunter Salas, even if it doesn't lead to a ton of, offensively even if he plays 15 minutes he's going to get a few buckets just from offensive rebounds from runouts from uh, a couple of backdoor cuts as well so that's what I would love to see I'm not confident that Mark Few is going to do that but it is definitely something I'm going to be watching for in this game number three the battle of the bigs Drew Timmy versus Johan Masalski Chet Holmgren in that conversation as well of course there's multiple different questions that come out of this conversation are the Dons going to let Masalski guard Drew one-on-one? He's one of the few big men in the conference who is capable of doing so. He's big. He uses his feet well. He uses his body well. He's good at not committing a lot of fouls. I think that they're one of the teams that could attempt to just try to handle Drew one-on-one and see how that goes. Drew had a lot of points against them last time they played, but he didn't shoot particularly well. I think there's an opportunity for the Dons to try that again and see if they can frustrate Drew into shooting under 50% from the field without having to double team him. Now, the problem with that is if if Drew does continue to shoot well and they for, they're forced to double team him, that, that allows Chet Holmgren to be more open. Uh, the Zags can also do plenty of other things uh, to help curb this potential mismatch that they might have. But I think the best thing to do is just to let Drew go to work one-on-one. And he, he, this is a guy who scored 30 points against Evan Mobley in the USC last year. So with no disrespect to Moskalski, it's very possible that Drew comes out and just goes to work in the paint, which forces USF to adopt a different strategy. Uh is also one of the most efficient scorers in the conference. He's one of the only players in the conference who has a higher field goal percentage than Drew Timmy. The other one is Chet Holmgren. <laughs> so this is a game of three of the most efficient low post scores in the entire country and the three most efficient low post scores in the WCC. That is going to make it an interesting matchup. Are they going to trade buckets down low consistently? Is somebody going to step up defensively and fluster the other player to the point where they're not shooting as capably as they currently are? Misalski is going to have his work cut out for him offensively. He's either going to be up against Drew Timmy, who is not a great low post defensive player, but is better than most of the players that Misalski has faced this season, or he's going to go up against Chet Holmgren, who is an elite defensive player and the best player that he has gone up against defensively this entire season. So if the Zags can slow down Misalski, Salski offensively, and if Drew Timmy and or Chet Holmgren can have one of their trademark efficient 65-70% from the field type nights, that gives them a huge advantage in the paint, which takes away one of USF's biggest strengths. And then the next thing, will the Zags outside shooting come back? It hasn't been very consistent lately. We're talking about a team that you know, was not very good to begin the season. We had lots of conversation about their outside shooting in the non-conference slate, Then they went on a torrid stretch to start the conference slate well over 45% from three for many of those games. Just looked absolutely ridiculous. Knocked down 20-plus threes against Shantae Leggins and the Portland Pilots. And then now they've been a little bit less consistent. Again, it's kind of been a season of ebbs and flows, a bit of a roller coaster with the outside shooting. The last time these two teams played, the Zag shot 5 for 18 from three, which is about 27%. Uh, last time, Strother was 1 for 5. Nempard was 1 for 4. Bolton was 0 for 1. The guards did not shoot it well the last time these two teams played. That was going to need to change. Even if Drew Timmy has a more efficient night, even if Chet Holmgren has a more efficient night down low, the Zags are going to need to hit threes to beat San Francisco. This is a good, well-coached, analytically savvy team who is going to try to take away Gonzaga's ability to score on the inside and make it hard for them to get open three-pointers. The Zags, when they get those looks, they need to knock them down. They need to knock them down. Nemhard and Strother can't combine to go two for nine. 
Bolton can't only take one three-pointer. Those things are going to need to change. The Zags won last time. Don't get me wrong. It's not like the recipe that they used last time didn't work. They secured a victory. But I would be surprised if the Zags could get away with only two three-pointers between Strother, Nempard, and Bolton and still pull out a victory here. They're going to need to shoot it better from beyond the arc in order to win this game. And the last thing is not specifically something I'll be watching in this game, but there are two very big conference games going down in the WCC outside of this game. BYU is playing LMU and St. Mary's is playing San Diego. Neither of them are playing huge, high-quality opponents, which is why they are must wins, must wins. This is the only game St. Mary's cannot lose, in my mind, and they'll still make the NCAA tournament. They can lose to Gonzaga. They can lose in the WCC. They shouldn't lose in the first round, but even if they lose in the second round and don't make the WCC championship, if they beat San Diego here and lose that game, I think they're still making the NCAA tournament. Right now, most bracketologists have them on the sixth line. Like they're, They have a fairly secure at-large bid right now. But if they lose to San Diego, their worst game left on their schedule, that is a huge, that puts them squarely on the bubble. That's a big problem for Randy Bennett and his team. BYU, every single game from here on out is a must win. They need to win basically every single game that they have left in order to have a chance of making the NCAA tournament. If they lose to LMU, it is pure curtains. They are done. They are out of the bubble conversation almost certainly. So I'm going to be watching both of these games, at least tracking both these games while, of course, watching the Gonzaga-San Francisco game because these are big games for the opportunity for the WCC to have multiple bids in March. All right. First segment down in the second segment, I'm going to be discussing my five, or excuse me, I'm going to be discussing a few listener submitted questions. They were submitted for Andy Locks, but they're more like questions. So we're going to take them in segment two instead. Before we get there, though, let's talk about today's sponsor, Run Your Pool. March Madness is only three weeks away. That means you need to start thinking about now about what you're going to be running your brackets this year. Are you going for the usual or are you going for the best? We've done our homework here, and we're running backwards brackets with RunYourPool.com. Along with standard brackets, Run Your Pool offers game types like Survivor or Pick X. They have options to edit scoring, and they offer more intel to make your picks. All stuff you won't find at ESPN or CBS. If you've got a business, Run Your Pool can help take some of that March Madness magic and play alongside your employees or even gain customers. Plus, they offer full white glove customer support custom branding, and one of the easiest three-minute setups you'll ever find. Clearly, we believe in Run Your Pool because, like I said, we're running our brackets there ourselves. There's no truer test than that. If you want to play against us for a shot at a cash prize, join us at runyourpool.com slash locked on. And while you're there, create your own pool for your friends and family. Enter Pure Madness at checkout for $10 off your custom pool. All the rules and details will be available there. That's runyourpool.com slash locked on for your chance to win a cash prize. We look forward to seeing and beating you there. All right, segment two, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags. We're still getting previewed for the last two games of the WCC regular season for the Zags on the road in the Bay against the San Francisco Dons on Thursday night and the St. Mary's Gales on Saturday uh, it's Andy Locks, so people submit listener-submitted questions or hot takes, and I grade them in the second segment. A lot of these were questions. Some of them were submitted for Mailbag Monday that I did not get to. Some of them were submitted for Andy Locks and hot takes. I decided to kind of cram the four questions here into this segment. We're going to talk through them, and then we're going to talk about more of the hot takes. In the final segment, this first question came via Gmail. I missed it on Monday from Aaron. He says, I could be totally off on this. But I felt last year's team didn't really have a point guard. It had two or three. I feel this year Nempart is the clear point guard and is referred to as the primary point guard. Has basketball changed over the years to not focus as much on the point guard position? Is it just Gonzaga that has changed now that the talent has risen? Or is it that just a misconception on my part? I felt even in the days of Josh Perkins, the offense ran through him. It can be a positive in that if the point guard has an off day, it doesn't kill the team's chances. Yeah, so I think Gonzaga's best teams have always had two point guards. That, that's been consistent for the history of Gonzaga. Blake Stepp and Dan Dickow played together on some of Gonzaga's really good early teams. Kevin Pangos and David Stockton. Stockton did not start 
for that 2012-2013 team, but he played a lot of minutes off the bench. That was the first team that in Gonzaga history that was ranked number one. Nigel Williams-Goss and Josh Perkins is probably the best example of a two-point guard lineup that was very, very successful for the Zags. That was, of course, their first run to the national championship game. Uh, yes, a lot of things flowed through Josh Perkins, but that was two point guards distinctly starting on that team. Of course, Jalen Suggs and Andrew Nempard both started for the majority of last season as well. So every team that Gonzaga's had that's gone to the national championship, most every team that has been ranked number one in the country, all of those teams have had multiple point guards. I think it's good to have multiple ball handlers. It makes it a little bit more tricky to defend. Uh, defensively, it's, it's challenging to kind of know who's going to bring the ball up, who's going to facil facilitate the offense. For the Zags last year in particular, Nemhart is much more of a, a controlled offensive player, more pick-and-roll savvy. Uh, we've seen that a lot this year, but last year, pairing that with Jalen Suggs, who was a bit more aggressive, a bit more likely to try to get to the basket, uh, do stuff like that, it, it just created a, a challenge defensively on how to figure out how to handle these guys. So I think basketball has changed to, to be a little bit less positionally focused. Uh, you know, you have six foot ten guys playing point guard roles in the NBA and, and smaller guys playing Draymond Green's a six foot eight center. Like it, it's the positions have changed a lot and kind of melded together, uh, particularly in the NBA. It's bleeding into college basketball. And Mark Few has been some a, a primary component of playing somewhat positionless basketball. Uh, the talent level obviously has risen at Gonzaga as well. So that has made that part of the deal. But I think that the Zags have this fortunate ability to to kind of move move guys around and play guys off the ball and play guys on the ball and and kind of change things up throughout the season and throughout the individual games, which just makes it more difficult to figure out how to guard them. Next up, this one comes from Darren at HeavyDo44 on Twitter. He says, tie, go, tie score, 30 seconds left in the game. Who are you going to for the bucket? Drew Timmy. Uh, if it's a 30, 30 seconds left, one final possession, tie game, we're having Nemhard dribble, dribble, until there's 10-ish eh, seconds left, 8 to 10 seconds left. Drew Timmy comes up, sets a high pick and roll. They go from there. The, I'm not doing anything more complicated than that. The rest of the lineup is shooters. Have Chet in the corner. Have Julian Strother in the corner. Have Rasir Bolton in the corner. Uh, ready to catch a pass for a three if we need it. Uh, but Nembhard's dribbling the ball out. The high pick comes from Timmy. Nembhard comes off the screen. If Timmy's open on the roll, hit him. Boom. That should be an easy two or at least a foul and a chance to get that winning shot from the free throw line. Uh, if the role people go with Drew Timmy and Nemhard can get a free lane to the basket, I'm good with that. If Nemhard can hit a little mid-range shot with five or six seconds left, I'm good with that too. Like all of the results here are good. If they play the pick and roll extremely well, it probably means that somebody crept down from the corner. So now you're looking at a kick out to Strother or to Holmgren and potentially getting a shot that way. That's not the most ideal situation. Hacking up a three with four or five seconds on the clock in a tie game is less than ideal. But I think that we've seen Nemhard and Timmy run that high pick and roll enough times to know that the likely outcome is Drew Timmy getting a lay-in or at least a, an opportunity to convert from the free throw line. And I'm willing to take that bet. I'm willing to... That's that's what I want to do. Drew Timmy is one of the most efficient scorers in the country. I'm very happy putting the ball in his hands with a few seconds left in a tie game. Next up, this is another one from Aaron via Gmail. He says, should Mark Few be considered for coach of the year? Tommy Lloyd left and now has Arizona at as high of a level as they have been in a long time. And after a tough offseason, Few has kept the team together. Few has proven he can succeed without Lloyd, but his DUI shouldn't be turned into a positive as a like a learning thing for him. That may be the reason he doesn't get much consideration, but I understand if you don't want to raise the topic. Yeah, I'm not going to give the DUI too much airtime. It's been talked about ad nauseum about Mark Few, uh, but I will say it's going to absolutely impact how people vote for him as the national coach of the year. It's going to cost him consideration. I think that's fine. <laughs> I'm not going to be really, really upset if people don't vote for Mark Few and if that's a, a potential reason, if they write some whole big piece about it and get all holier than thou, then yeah, maybe we'll we'll have some words. But for the most part, if people are like, eh, I, I'm, I'm leaning another candidate instead of Few and that's kind of part of their reasoning, eh, that's fine. Having said that, Few turned a team that lost three starters to the NBA, Corey Kispert, Joe Eliai, Jalen Suggs. A, a very, very good team lost three huge key pieces. He took another team that added three freshmen to the roster, a grad transfer, very new roster, a lot of new faces, and he turned them into a, a team that's as good or better than last year's team. That is incredible. They had a loss to Duke that was basically variance because a three-point loss is nothing. They had a, a bad game against Alabama, no team 
in the country hasn't had a bad game this year. Every team has had a bad game. Their bad game came against a good team. Alabama's a good team. They've struggled a little bit since then, but they're a good team. Uh, they had a bad game against Tarleton State, but one, not a big deal. Then they blow out Texas Tech, and then they cruise through WCC play without any issues, at least up to this point. I, you have to consider Mark Few. They're number one team in the country. The odds-on favorite to win the national championship. You have to consider him. My vote, I'd probably go to Tommy Lloyd. I, what he has done at Arizona has been incredible. Obviously, I'm a little biased. I love Tommy Lloyd, <laughs> but it's hard to not consider him the front runner. When he took a team that was not very good under Sean Miller, kept a lot of the same players, changed the way they run things offensively, and now look at them. They're you know one of the five best teams in the country, arguably one of the three best teams in the country, playing extremely well. There's other considerations here as well. It's not just between Mark Few and Tommy Lloyd. Ed Cooley at Providence absolutely deserves some consideration here. Bruce. Bruce Pearl at Auburn, who I know has had some issues himself as well, but this Auburn team is very, very good. Uh, and so he absolutely deserves some consideration there as well. Last question of this segment comes from Amish Goat Farm on Twitter, who says, if Arizona wins a championship under Lloyd this year or before Gonzaga does, how damaging is that going to be towards Gonzaga's recruiting? Seems like both a West Coast competitor for recruits and the recruits thinking GU's success was more due to few than Lloyd. So I... <laughs> I can pretty much promise you that recruits, high school kids, are not thinking about that final point. They are not, if they're considering Gonzaga or Arizona, they're thinking much more about what it's going to do for themselves, their opportunities to win a national championship, and then they're thinking about extenuating factors. The campus, the, you know, the classes, the if they have other teammates or friends or family who are there, how close it is to their house. Like, they're absol absolutely thinking about, is this school going to win a championship? Is this school going to prepare me for the NBA? Those are things that both Mark Few and Tommy Lloyd can promise. Arizona has a rich history of turning players into NBA players. Tommy Lloyd is going to be very, very good at continuing that. Gonzaga obviously has a very strong history there. I don't think recruits are wondering like, well, is Mark Few only good because of Tommy Lloyd? They don't think about that. That's something that diehard college fans think about. That's something that analysts may think about. I don't think that's something that high school basketball players think about. And I think sometimes we, we get a little too far in the weeds on, on wondering if if recruits are thinking the same kind of deep stuff, deep level thinking about college basketball that we are, they're not, they're not, they're not thinking about that stuff. I've talked to recruits. I've hung out with recruits when I was working in college athletics. Those are not the things that they think about for the most part. They want to go to a school where they have a chance to win a championship and make a huge shot in March. Both of these schools, again, provide that. Arizona has a bigger campus, has better weather, has some other advantages that Gonzaga doesn't. Gonzaga has a rabid fan base, which is a huge argument in favor of them, a really cool experience at the kennel, uh, and also obviously has, has this incredible development program that Tommy Lloyd will probably develop in time but does not have proven yet, whereas you can go to Mark Few and, and know that, hey, in a year or two, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to improve tremendously as a basketball player. So, yeah, there. The, the short answer to the question is, yeah, they're, they're, if Tommy Lloyd won a national championship, it would probably hurt Gonzaga's recruiting. I don't think there's any debate against that. Even now, Tommy Lloyd has already is already going to challenge Gonzaga recruiting-wise. Just being there, having a successful first season, even if they bow out early in the tournament, even if they don't win at all, even if Gonzaga does win it all. If, if the Zags win it all, obviously that's going to help them on the recruiting trail. But Arizona is going to cut in here. They're going to make things a little bit more challenging for the Zags. Now, the Zags don't always recruit – West Coast players, that is not really a routine. They, they obviously recruit some. Ben Gregg is from Oregon. Obviously, Dominic Harris is from California. Julian Strother is from Las Vegas. But, you know, Strath or excuse me, uh, Suggs and Holmgren, obviously from Minnesota. Drew Timmy is from Texas. Like, this is not the only place that Gonzaga is pulling recruits. Salas is from uh, uh, Nebraska. So, obviously, a lot of nuance there that I don't think is necessarily going to just mean that a lot of Gonzaga's recruits are just going to go to Arizona. Now, I don't think that, that that's how this is going to shake out. All right. Two segments down coming up in the third segment, we're going to look at some listener submitted hot takes and grade them too hot, too cold, or just right. Before we get there though, let's talk about bet online. There might be less football being played, but BetOnline.net has way more stuff to bet on this playoff season from scores, totals, and player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, BetOnline is the number one spot for all things NFL betting in 2022. And it's not just football. BetOnline.net's basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC odds coverage is the best in the business. From sports right down to your favorite Vegas casino games, BetOnline is your number one online wagering destination. BetOnline, the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports and play your favorite games. 
Bet online where the game starts. All right, segment three. Still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags, and we're still taking listeners submitted hot takes, grading them for Andy Locks, too hot, too cold, or just right. This first take comes from Christian. Christian says, Mark Pope and Todd Golden will not be coaching BYU and USF next season. So we'll start with Golden. I think that's very possible. Uh, I think it's very sad. <laughs> I hope that it is not the reality, but doing such a good job with the San Francisco team. He's so analytically focused. He's a young coach. Like those are a lot of the things that these high major programs are going to look for. If Andy Enfield, the current USC coach takes a job at Maryland, which is something that is rumored to happen. USC could do a lot worse than Colin Todd Golden. And man, if Todd Golden got offered the job at USC, I'm thinking he's going to take it. And I don't blame him for that. It sucks for the WCC if that were to happen. That's not the only job that could become available. Who knows what happens at Stanford and Cal? Those programs are both struggling. Uh, then there are plenty of non-West Coast programs that could call Todd Golden as well. So uh, I would not be shocked if that is the reality for Todd Golden. I'd be more surprised about Mark Pope. BYU's struggles the last half of this season are very significant. BYU's probably, at this point, not going to make the NCAA tournament. A Mark Pope-led BYU team that does not make the NCAA tournament in the in the WCC probably is not going to lend him to getting a lot of job offers. It also doesn't likely lead to him getting fired. So I doubt he gets fired. I doubt he gets a, a lot of significant offers. And he's in line to become a Big 12 head coach because that's where BYU is going. So I, I, it would have to be a pretty appealing job for Mark Pope to leave and I don't think he's earned a lot of phone calls for super appealing jobs. Could change. Obviously, I think he is a good coach. I'm not trying to, to disparage him as a coach, but the results haven't really been there this year. And I think that that's going to hamper his ability to get a, a good enough job for him to be willing to leave a job that's about to become a Big 12 job in a couple of years. So I'm going to say this is just right in the sense that I think 50% of it could definitely happen, but I'd be pretty surprised if both these things happen. This next take comes from Pace and Space Jam on Twitter, who says, Gonzaga doesn't have a leave it all on the floor type dog player that's needed to win an NCAA title. So I have said this on this podcast a few times before. I'm, I'm not particularly comfortable ascribing uh, these kinds of characteristics to athletes that I don't know personally. I, I don't think anybody should be very comfortable doing that, if we're being honest. Um, I don't know what evidence we have as people who watched the games to, to indicate what kind of dog mentality that these guys have. I don't know how we can quantify that. And I don't know what is, is causing this to be a belief about this team. In my mind, Drew to me is absolutely that guy. He's a little bit silly and a little bit goofy, but he would go to war for every single person on this team and is the kind of player that I would, I would absolutely trust him in a late game situation to get it done. Yes, Jalen Suggs was a bit more pronounced in that way. He hit some big shots against BYU uh, in the regular season and obviously the huge shot against UCLA. But I, I don't think that this team is lacking that kind of player. I don't see any evidence. Yeah, they struggled against Alabama, had a bad game. There were some coaching mistakes that I thought were pretty prevalent in that game. But it wasn't a lack of a player with a dog mentality. Duke just came down to the wire and Duke happened to win that one. But I think that Chet seems like he'd do anything to win. Roz Bolton is very tired of losing. He would do anything to win. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't see any reason to believe these guys aren't leaving it all out on the floor. They don't have that kind of mentality. Um, I, and I don't think that every team that's won a national title has had like clear cut those types of dudes. I, I just, I think that it's something that when we kind of look through it with rose colored glasses, when teams win, oh, they were a bunch of dogs. When teams lose, oh, they didn't have that kind of dog mentality. I don't know that there's <laughs> there's any way to actually quantify this. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of a hard one to answer. But I think Gonzaga has plenty of players who are going to leave it all on the floor if they get the opportunity to play in a national championship game. Next take comes from Christian via Gmail. Christian says the WCC championship game will be Santa Clara and Gonzaga. That would be so fun. That would be so fun. I would not want Gonzaga to lose. I want to be very clear, very, very clear that I don't want Gonzaga to lose that game. But if they're going to lose the WCC championship game, that is who I want it to be because that is the only way Santa Clara makes 
the NCAA tournament. They had too bad of a non-conference slate because of injuries that they're not in consideration for an at-large bid right now, nor should they be. I, I think they're a good enough team to play in the NCAA tournament, but their resume is not there. But if they were to do this and win this game, they would be an NCAA tournament team. And that would be super cool. I, it would, I would hope it wouldn't knock Gonzaga off the one line. It depends on if Arizona runs through the Pac-12 championship or not. Uh, but if it isn't going to impact Gonzaga's seeding, eh, I could live with that as a loss. Uh, I, I'm also not sure that I believe this. I think it's just right as a hot take. Uh, Santa Clara would have to shake by St. Mary's um, potentially, or they'd have to you know, beat BYU or San Francisco. They've beaten both BYU and San Francisco this year. Uh, they're playing their best basketball right now. So I don't think this is crazy by any stretch of the imagination whatsoever. Um, I would probably pick St. Mary's if the two of them matched up in a semifinal game. Uh, but I wouldn't be shocked if Santa, if, excuse me, if Santa Clara is playing that game as well. Next up, this comes from Dad Risk on Twitter. Gonzaga wins more games in the NCAA tournament than the entire Pac-12 combined. Ooh, uh, I love it. <laughs> it's probably too hot, but I love it. Uh, so the, the most games the Zags can win is five. Uh, that's, you know, the first national championship in school history. Five wins. Arizona is going to win at least two. I, I cannot imagine them not making it to the Sweet 16. Let's say that they do, in my mind, worst case scenario, two wins. USC and UCLA, I can't imagine them not winning their first round games. <laughs> USC is going to be a top four seed. USC is probably going to be a top six seed. USC could, could get bounced by a good 11 seed. I don't think that's crazy to imagine, but I would be surprised. USC is playing pretty good basketball right now. And then WCU and Oregon could sneak into a play-in game. Uh which is a, a, not an easy win, but a more likely game that they're going to win. So the Zags, if they don't win five, if they win four, then I think it's really, really hard for them to win more games than the entire the entire uh, Pac-12. I do think this is possible. <laughs> I think it would be pretty surprising, but I do think it's probably fun. To be clear, I would love it. It'd be hilarious if the Zags you know, won a national championship game and the rest of the teams combined for four or five wins uh, amongst the Pac-12. But I don't think that it's particularly likely. But that makes it a very good quality, just right hot take in my mind. Next up from Christian, he says, the four-bid WCC should be Zags, St. Mary's, USF, and Santa Clara, but will only be Zags and St. Mary's. That should be relative. I talked about this already. Santa Clara uh, is good enough to play in the NCAA tournament, but their resume is not good enough. And uh, that is accurate. Like it, I, I'm not going to be upset if Santa Clara does not get any consideration for an at-large bid because they do not deserve it based on their non-conference resume, which is unfortunate because they were dealing with injuries and now they are a good enough team to play in March. Uh, I hope it's not just Gonzaga and St. Mary's. Uh, USF obviously is, is potentially going to take a loss against the Zags on Thursday, but then they have San Diego. If they win that game against San Diego, if they win one game in the uh, WCC tournament, if they make it to the semifinals, if they make it to the championship, I think they're in. I think there's a good chance there. And if San Francisco can beat St. Mary's and play Gonzaga in the championship, then I think San Francisco makes it. I still think St. Mary's makes it because losing to San Francisco is a quad one loss. Doesn't hurt the Gales all that much. So I think there's definitely still a path for those three teams to make it. Santa Clara is not going to make it unless they win the championship. BYU at this point is probably out unless they get some desperate hot streak, manage to get a game against Kansas State, beat them, win it, the rest of their WCC games, make it out to a title game. But yeah, I, I think I'm hoping it's more than Zags and St. Mary's. Uh, Sam, Santa Clara is good enough to play in the tournament now, but does not have the resume, unfortunately. Next up, Yanks Zags on Twitter, who says the Zags next game decided by single digits will be in the final four. It's a it's a redo, <laughs> the redo of last season. Uh, I think this is just right. I think it's possible that this is the reality. I think if the Zags have to play St. Mary's two more times, which they play them once on Saturday, they'll play them again potentially in the NCAA or excuse me in the WCC tournament. Yeah, I, I, playing St. Mary's three times in a year, it's going to be difficult to beat them by 10 or more points all three times. I think there's a very real possibility that the game on Saturday in, in Moraga is determined by less than 10 points. I think if they face them in the WCC championship, that that game is potentially determined by less than 10 points. Every other team, I think there's a reasonable chance to assume they win by more than 10. San Francisco, they could win by more than 10. They did last time, even though that was a, a closer game than the final score indicated. Uh, first couple of rounds of the NCAA tournament, they usually win by more than 10. But again, it's the NCAA tournament. Anything can happen. I think there's absolutely good enough teams uh, that they could play in the round of 32, the Sweet 16, the Elite Eight, uh, that would keep that game within 10. So this is not going to be an easy task, 
for the Zags. Uh, not necessarily something that I would bet significantly would happen, but I think it's a good hot take because I think it definitely could happen. Hell, it happened last year, so it definitely could happen this year. And the final hot take of the show comes from Christian. He says, Corey Kisper would have won the three-point contest. Yeah, so the, <laughs> the NBA All-Star Game weekend was filled with a lot of not-so-great games. The Three-point contest was a little disappointing. The dunk contest was wildly disappointing. The skills challenge was different. Uh, so it was a bit of a disappointing weekend. Uh, as for whether Corey would have won the three-point contest, that's <laughs> impossible to know. Uh, straight shooting three-point contests like that are are weird. It's not necessarily a good indication of just the best peer shooter. It's not in-game shooting. It's more of an endurance activity because you're shooting for 60 straight seconds. I have no idea how Corey would have done in that contest. Honestly, no clue. Haven't seen him shoot 60 or is you know that many threes in a 60 second uh, period of time because that's not a very NBA savvy drill to be doing. Uh, but he's a really good three point shooter, <laughs> so it's possible. I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, I would love to see him in a three point contest eventually. It'd be cool to have some Zags participating in that event because they have a lot of really good shooters. Uh, it would also be cool to see Zags in other events, and I think we will. And as time goes on, maybe Suggs will do a dunk contest, maybe Corey will do the three point shootout. Like, there's plenty of opportunities. Simonis won the skills challenge last year, so obviously the Zags have already started to infiltrate some of those events. But it'd be cool to see that continue to to happen as as more and more Gonzaga players get into the NBA. All right, folks, enjoy the game tonight. I'm happy to chat with you all on Twitter during the contest. Go Zags. As always, I'll be back on Friday with a recap right here on the Locked On Zags podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube. Thank you again to those of you who have made this podcast your first listen of the day. This is a great time to make your second listen of the day, the Locked On Bets podcast. Locked On Bets is your daily one-stop shop for all of your sports gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q, with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags.